This video is about My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. However, it's also a literary analysis that discusses mature themes. This video has been correctly labeled as not intended for children in full cooperation with COPPA regulations. Furthermore, this video contains topics that may be upsetting to some viewers, such as prison and my, fr frankly, offensively mediocre makeup skills. I, 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 I'm so sorry. Hey dudes, dudettes, and doodles. Remember how I said that the Warriors video was still going to happen? Well, it turns out I no longer have the time necessary to do the research for that video. So... It's going to be out way later than I had said it would be out. <laughs> way long ago. I'm sure no one even remembers that I was going to make that. But I wrote this script back in September. It yeah, it's taken me three months to make this video that took a fraction of the time like to actually put together. So just imagine if this video was about a book instead of an episode of My Little Pony. My Little Pony is a television show for children that ended a year ago with nine seasons. I actually didn't know that the show had been ended until I googled it so I could write that line, but um, it seems kind of appropriate for some reason now because it's officially over a year since it ended, so it's kind of like, oh it's done and now we can look back on the good times. <laughs> I really do like My Little Pony, and there's a small part of me that will be sad to see it go. I've been rewatching it lately, and I just had some thoughts on it that I wanted to get off my chest. For those of you who haven't seen it, don't worry, I'm going to be summarizing the main plot points that you need to know, but, don't, but also don't worry, I'm not going to go into like ridiculous amounts of detail, so hopefully it won't be too boring. <laughs> look away at my frickin um, script over here. That also means of course that there will be spoilers if that's something that you care about. I only read my freaking thing one sentence at a time. I'd really like this series to be somewhat of an open dialogue so please leave uh, your comments in the comment section telling me what you think. Um, I'm not like an expert on any of the things that I'm going to be talking about so I really just I'm really just making it because I want to um, talk to people about my thoughts on it. Um, YouTube is kind of inconsistent about like t uh, giving me notifications when people comment on my videos so if it takes me a while to respond that's probably why. Without further ado, dramatic fado. Part 1, Deeper Than What Meets the Eye. I started rewatching My Little Pony Friendship is Magic because I was getting really stressed out with the changes and the stress happening in my life and I just wanted to watch a fun, silly, simple, lighthearted kids show. But because I overanalyze it everything, that was a weird way to phrase it, but because I overanalyze everything, I ended up with something even better. A silly, fun, surprisingly complex kids show. I'm pretty sure at least half of what I'm going to be talking about in this video is just completely made up by me, but I find I don't really care that much. Um, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic was designed to introduce children to like lessons about morality and friendship, and my general goal is to adapt them to be useful to a more older audience. I think My Little Pony is the perfect example of how we sometimes expect children to behave better than adults. The morals in the story when applied to children are completely uncontroversial, but if we begin to apply the same lessons in our adult lives, I believe we can begin- <laughs> I believe- <laughs> This one is so stupid, I hate it so much. Okay. But if we try to apply them to our, our adult lives, we can begin to see <laughs> power through it. It's a serious, it's a serious line. 
we can begin to see my little pony it's revolutionary is the line I decided to write in the script three months ago and I just can't say it with a straight face I'm so sorry I tried the first two episodes I think are a very well executed thesis for the show on the surface it seems very much like a cliche power friendship show and it is <laughs> but here's the thing according to my script what makes a cliche interesting is not um how it says even when it isn't subverted is how it's used so my script says it's how it's used in the context of the show and the uh freaking the context that surrounds it which is the, sh the show we can go from talking about the same old friendship is good line to actually interesting conversations about relationships children's television is supposed to act like a introduction to more complicated topics whether you're talking about math or morality it's like a foothold or a, a guide to understanding the world so how does my little pony guide us and where is it guiding us to part two with the criminal justice system so that was a bit of an awkward segue uh my little pony isn't convincing people to commit crimes probably i understand the wording there may have been a bit awkward on my part anyway the first episode the first two episodes of my little pony are all about how a powerful pony princess's petulant perfidy over paranoia of poultry plaudits precipitated pun- holy shit no anyway i originally wrote a clever like segue into the next section but it's a tongue twister and and it's long and i don't want to say it Princess Luna is one of the two rulers of Equestria, the other one being her sister, Princess Celestia. Luna has the power to raise and lower the moon, and Celestia does the same with the sun. In the beginning of the first episode, it is explained that the citizens of Equestria, and presumably the whole world, right? Because the sun and the moon don't just affect one country. Anyway, the citizens of Equestria absolutely love Celestia, and the sun in the daytime and all that, but they kind of shun Luna, or at least she feels like they do. Luna becomes overcome with jealousy, loneliness, and grief, and decides to refuse to lower the moon, causing an eternal night for some reason, I don't know. Luna becomes Nightmare Moon because she's very self-aware about the whole villainy thing and is trying to build a brand. It's also shown later in this show that she maybe tries to kill Celestia, it's been a while since I've seen that episode, and that's not what we're talking about right now. Anyway, Celestia has to stop her sister, so she uses the elements of harmony to trap Nightmare Moon in the moon. And that's in the moon, not on the moon, just for clarity. After all that's taken care of, Celestia takes over responsibility for the sun and the moon. I guess that point isn't super relevant, but it does highlight how ridiculously time-consuming these ponies' jobs must be. They never really explain how the sun and moon still work when they're doing different things, unless they bring that up in season 9, I haven't seen it yet. Sorry I went on a bit of a tangent there, but I had to make this section of the video a bit longer. It's worth noting here that Luna's crimes aren't really consistent with political crimes like terrorism or something, at least as far as I know, she was mostly motivated by insecurity and a family feud. Her crimes were also pretty preventable. Maybe invest in pony princess family therapy or something. To be fair, this is hardly an accurate representation of why people commit crimes. A single fictional crime rarely is. Luckily for me, I didn't name this section why crime happens, but the criminal justice system, and there's a good reason for that. When Luna escapes the moon after a thousand years, she still very much wants to cause her whole eternal night thing. 
to the surprise of absolutely no one watching. It's almost as though being completely isolated for a thousand years doesn't make a person very sociable. With the social isolation many of us are experiencing right now, I feel like I shouldn't have to explain why solitary confinement is incredibly sucky, but I will anyway. Many of you likely know that solitary confinement is bad psychologically, but what you might not realize is that it actually changes the physical structure of the brain. Solitary confinement reduces the size of the hippocampus, which leads to weakened memory and spatial awareness. It also leads to an increase of activity in the parts of the brain that deal with fear. A person in solitary confinement will likely experience, among other problems, mood disorders, damage to brain function, and hallucinations. Solitary confinement is torture. It's torture that some people think is justified, either for revenge, which I won't be entertaining in this video, or more practically, to teach someone a lesson and keep people safe. We'll get around to keeping people safe in a sec, but I want to start with the part about teaching people who commit crime a lesson. Let's see what my favorite philosophical manifesto, which is My Little Pony, has to say on the subject. Well, Luna was punished for a long time, too, but she didn't exactly learn her lesson. Luna is a pony with problems. Her problems can be solved, and she is an incredible benefit to society when she isn't locked up or lashing out violently. But Luna's problems can't be solved by being shoved somewhere else, and neither can the world's problems with Luna. As long as the stars are up there to align themselves, her escape from the moon, from anywhere, is inevitable. And all of this is true of real life crime as well. Unlike what most people believe, prisons don't deter crime, like, at all. And they actually increase the likelihood that a convict will reoffend. In fact, there isn't a lot of evidence that any punishment deters crime. All it does is alienate and injure those who offend by making them social prize in their own communities, by turning the public against them, by causing the mental injuries we discussed earlier, and obviously by physical injuries, especially from people who are from vulnerable communities. My hand teleported, don't, don't worry about it. I don't think it should be particularly surprising that violence isn't exactly uncommon in prison, whether that's by fellow inmates or the guards. And yet, even though study after study has shown that these practices are ineffective, they continue to remain commonplace. And this isn't a mistake in the system, it's an authoritarian system that's functioning perfectly. You see, the goal is neither to deter crime nor to protect people. The true goal of the criminal justice system in most countries is to suppress minorities and to keep power for the people who already have it. I called this video criminal justice reform, but replacement or revolution might be a better word for it. A side note that should be pretty unsurprising if you've been paying attention is that these things will also apply to other forms of punishment, including punishing children, in part because of the reasons I've already talked about, and also because they're too small and confused to really understand what's going on. Uh, the source that I've linked for that little fact also list alternatives to punishment that you might find interesting. Getting, getting back on track, if we actually wanted to deter crime, we would have stricter gun laws, we would have high quality universal education and healthcare, and we would have a strong social safety net. And for the crimes that are committed, we can implement a restorative justice system to help victims heal and safely reintegrate offenders into society. And on that note... Part 3. Friendship is magic. I think it's time to shift gears a little. Don't worry though, this is all going to tie back into my previous point. The actual main character of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic is Twilight Sparkle. 
Twilight is a pony who loves studying magic more than anything. She doesn't have time for friends, and this fact is relevant in every single decision she makes in the first episode. It's kind of like Taming of the Shrew, except about friendship instead of marriage and not completely horrifying. Twilight is Princess Celestia's student, and in the first episode, she figures out that Luna, or Nightmare Moon as she's known to the public at this point, was about to return. When she tells Celestia, though, she's sent out of the city to oversee preparations for a festival. Unbeknownst to Twilight, this is actually a pretext to make her make friends so that she can use the elements of harmony to defeat Nightmare Moon. Why was Celestia so confident that Twilight would make friends? The real question is why was Celestia so confident that Twilight would make exactly five friends, which is the number of friends she needed to be able to use the elements of harmony? The answer is that it's a kid's show and the plot had to happen like that in order to work. I, I mean, um, because Princess Celestia is super smart. It, Twilight, of course, makes the friends and gets the elements and they shoot Nightmare Moon with harmony beams. But instead of being imprisoned in the moon again, Nightmare Moon turns back into Princess Luna. If I can get into some headcanon here, the main six hits Nightmare Moon with friendship. And I don't mean that in a vague kids show way. The rainbow lights coming out of their jewelry is literally friendship. It's compassion, understanding, and comfort. Perhaps more accurately, it's loyalty, generosity, honesty, kindness, and laughter. Everything the elements of harmony represent. And magic, Twilight's magic, makes it all complete. Twilight's magic, I think, is particularly special. For all her magical prowess and natural talent, what really makes her light the spark and obtain the elements of harmony is her newfound realization that friendship is magic. And not just metaphoric magic, but actual reality-altering magic. I think it's incredibly empowering to step away from that tired friendship is good line and toward the understanding that we have the power to change lives through friendship by implementing the elements of harmony in our real lives. The entire show is basically just elaborating on that concept, which is also pretty much what I want to do with this video series. In the particular scene where Nightmare Moon is defeated, I think what we're really seeing is Luna experiencing what friendship feels like for the first time in an incredibly long time. I think this is also why Celestia imprisoned Luna in the moon instead of doing what the main six did. At the time, Celestia was the only one with the ability to use the elements of harmony against Nightmare Moon. The elements were designed to be used by a group of friends, and without them, Celestia isn't powerful enough to accomplish this particular spell. For those of you who actually remember the later episodes, don't bother commenting your actualies. I'm perfectly capable of retconning the crap out of this video if my points are contradicted in the future. First of all, I do think it's an interesting observation that the state failed to reform Nightmare Moon where members of the larger community succeeded. More poignantly though, Nightmare Moon, who wanted to destroy life on Earth as we know it, was stopped not through violence, but through friendship and reform. Restorative justice is the only way, at least that I can think of, of dealing with crime in a way that facilitates healing for the victims of crime, deals with the damage caused by offenders, and actually helps to reduce crime and reintegrate offenders back into society. I also want to mention that although there's of course no single cause of crime, poverty, a lack of access to mental health care, and easy access to guns are pretty high up there. I also feel the need to point out that restorative justice was actually pretty common in a variety of Aboriginal societies before the Europeans came in and destroyed all of their social institutions, and that is certainly not the only way that criminal justice is intrinsically tied to race, so I'm going to leave some links in the description for you to check out about that. Um, along with links about how it affects uh, the LGBTQ plus and mental health communities. Speaking of mental illness, I felt I should make a note on that because it felt the most relevant to today's episode. 
I am relatively active in online mental health communities. Um, and it's an issue I care very deeply about. So I want to be clear that that is where I am coming from when I say this next part. The truth is that approximately 60% of criminal offenders suffer from at least one mental health problem. Now, again, mental illness is far from the sole cause of crime. And a lot of people, perfectly reasonably, will say things like, having a mental illness does not make you more likely to commit crime. And although I understand what they mean by that, and where they're coming from, I don't find the approach particularly helpful. This is because crime as a concept is not a natural one. Society decides what crime is, and it seems to me, and people who are a lot smarter than me, that the criminal justice system attempts to and succeeds at focusing on people who are deemed as undesirable to society and removing those people. Particularly people of color, the working class, women, LGBTQ plus people, and people who struggle with mental illnesses. Basically, what counts as a crime isn't static. If suicide were still considered a crime, it seems rational to think that crime rates among people with depression would be higher than they currently are. Furthermore, we kind of forget that crime doesn't necessarily mean violent crime. Um, and now I want to be clear that the thing I'm about to say does not mean that you should commit crime, okay? Don't commit crimes and definitely don't violate YouTube's terms of service agreement. But if you're a person with mental illness and you don't have access to mental health care, whether that's because you live in a place like Canada where government health care doesn't cover mental health care or medication, or if you live in a place like the United States where the government doesn't cover any health care and illegal drugs are cheaper, safer possibly even to get, quite possibly easier to get, what are you gonna do? I mean, like, come on, like, come on, you, you know what you do, even if it's not, and I mean, we could go beyond mental health care too with that. We could talk about, um, you know, chronic pain or, or anything like that. Um, but of course, mental health care is a, is a big point there. Uh, mental illness is a big, big point there. In a similar vein, people who suffer from mental health problems are more likely to experience homelessness, poverty, and unemployment. And to be clear, the causation goes both ways there. So it makes sense that crimes related to those situations like shoplifting and certain types of organized crimes would be slightly higher among people with mental illnesses. Of course, different mental health problems have different symptoms and maybe some of them carry higher crime rates than others. But regardless of that, the mental health community needs to stay unified at all costs. A lot of us are infantilized, dehumanized, criminalized, and some of us literally demonized. I have anxiety, depression, and ADHD, and I'm far from being in the most vulnerable groups but I will never distance myself from those vulnerable groups because of the stigma that surrounds them. That was a bit of a rant, but the point I'm trying to get across is that maybe having a mental illness does make you more likely to commit crimes, but maybe being more likely to commit crime 
doesn't make you a bad person.